So we have a special episode today, and it focuses on the book that Howie Jacobson and I wrote together. Howie will be interviewing me. I'm sure I'll be interviewing him a little bit too. We'll be in a conversation about the new book called You Can Change Other People, The Four Steps to Helping Your Employees, Colleagues, Even Family Up Their Game. And uh, Howie is with us today now. Howie, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you. And, and just for the interest of, of um, you know, multi-use, welcome to the Plant Yourself Podcast. I'm delighted. This is going to be really fun. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I'm not going to do, I'm not going to um, throw you uh, on the media training spot and say, so Peter, tell me what this book is about <laughs> in 30 <laughs> seconds. Instead, um, so I've been involved in this work for, for a long time, but you were, you were developing your, pro, your change process long before I met you. So can you like cast your mind back to kind of the origins of what is now the four steps like where did where did you first start learning about how to change other people, how to help other people accomplish things that they couldn't accomplish, get unstuck, up their game? And what did you find, you know, lacking or insufficient that led you to create your own model? You know, I like that we've been doing so many media interviews together because um, you're going to ask, and we're going to have conversations that we don't normally have. Nobody's asked me that question before. Um, I, I started, started my career leading expeditions, mountaineering, kayaking, climbing, and teaching people leadership uh, in the outdoors. And then I went from there, I started my own company, and then I joined a consulting firm uh, to both do and learn consulting. We, we, uh, sort of partnered on a bunch of projects and they asked me to join them and start a practice there on transformational change in organizations with a number of other consultants. Um, what I found as I did consulting and learned consulting, and it was really, really interesting is the dynamic was we come in as the experts. We know what we know, which is why they're hiring us. And we come in, we don't teach it to them and we don't help them do it. We do it for them. Like if I'm going to develop a competency model, I'm going to develop the competency model. And then I'm going to be doing the interviewing in order to help people fit into the right jobs and roles. And then when I went to Accenture, it was that on spades. Like at Accenture, we were really focused not only on doing things for people, but literally installing teams in an organization and, uh, and, and, and doing the work which from a consulting company's perspective is, um, is actually really useful because you make a lot of money and, you, um, uh, and you're essential because you can't leave because if you leave, so does all of your work. Um, and at the first consulting firm I was at, at the Hay Group, this woman named Beth Fletcher, who continues to be a friend and is a mentor, really felt like consulting should be done in a different way, in a collaborative way with clients. And so I learned a lot from her. And then when I went off on my own the second time, I decided I wanted, I actually didn't start by thinking about a co coaching company. I started by developing a consulting company that approached clients in a different way that actually changed them so that they can do the work that they were asking us to do, that developed their capability, that increased the capacity of the organization itself to do what they were asking us to do. In effect, making myself unessential, right? Like I was basically working myself out of a job with every one of my clients. Um, but that was the goal because if, if they weren't able to do it themselves, then, then they would never really be able to bring the methodology, the work, the change, the growth, the development into their lives and into their company. And so uh, this was the, the beginning of coaching. Coaching didn't really exist at that point. This was in the you know, early 90s when coaching was just starting. And so then I did a coach training program and, uh, and found that it wasn't very uh, organizationally focused. It was very much around, around life coaching. And it was very much around the skills of coaching. Like, how do we listen? How do we ask good questions? How do we do the things that a coach does well? Um, and what I found was lacking was a reliable process. 
So I could listen really well and I could ask really good questions and I could, you know, think in terms of structures, but I was hit or miss, meaning some of my conversations went well, some of them didn't, because there wasn't a process that was bringing them from point A to point Z. Like I wasn't bringing them through. And so I later articulated a definition of coaching, which is a reliable process that helps clients get massive traction on their most important work. And I just kept honing and working on the process. I kept looking at my failures and my successes and saying, what's the difference and what is this process? And that eventually led me to the four steps. Gotcha. So uh, it's interesting, you know, that you, you um, hit upon this model by, by which if you succeed, you're going to make yourself redundant and you kind of hate marketing. Right. Yeah, that's like you, true. you didn't you didn't think that through, did you? Well, you know what? I, I didn't like most of everything that I do. Like there's a way in which I'm thinking about the future, but there's a way in which I'm not. There's a way in which I'm thinking, what am I doing now? Is it working? And am I loving it? And am I at this, you know, Frederick Beekner intersection of doing what the world needs and what gives me the most joy? And, and that intersection is really important to me. But I will say that it's good that I didn't think too hard in the future because I am like, my clients are far longer lasting now than they would be with consulting projects because I developed these relationships with my clients that they find, and, and that's sort of the point of the book. Like if you help people change effectively, then they want you around. Like there's a, that's like a, that's a relationship that's helpful to them that, you know, they like clients I'm with for six, seven, 10 years. Like a, a lot of my clients I'm with them until they retire because the relationship with them is helpful and the need to continue to develop and grow and up your game doesn't, doesn't end. So it's up to them. They could cancel anytime that they want to, but it turns out that I'm more useful to them teaching them how to do things and helping them to change without needing me than I am when I try to force them to need me. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. I know you used in one of our other interviews last week, you used the phrase like deeply unstrategic. Right. <laughs> yeah. I find that's been totally true with my career. Like I, I, I am not sort of thinking, okay, I have this master plan. I'm thinking, I love what I'm doing, but there's this part that is not working as well as I want. And it's either because I'm not enjoying it as much or it's not as impactful or effective. You know, it's one of those two sides of the Frederick, Beekner, the Frederick Beekner equation. Either it's not meeting the world's need the way I think that it should, or it's not giving me the amount of joy. And then I keep tweaking it in order to, uh, in order to be closer to that, which by the way, makes it hard to scale as a company, right? Because I'm, you know, what Anderson Consulting, what Accenture does really, really well is they replicate methodology across 50,000 people. They scale really well, but they can't change as fast. For me, I'm super focused on the outcomes that I'm trying to get. And if I'm not getting those outcomes, then I want to change what I'm doing. And that makes it hard to like train a hundred people or a thousand people and get them to do all the same process in exactly the same way. But this book it is a way of scaling and encapsulates, you know, after 30 years, I've got a scalable process and I want people to be able to use it, not just coaches, but everybody. Oh uh -huh. yeah. It's like, uh, like the musician who has the, you know, it keeps working on the song until it's ready to really like 30 years. I'm still tweaking, you know, in the studio, the sound levels and the, the reverb. It's now, yeah. it's now ready for the public. And that's, that's the pleasure of writing this book with you, Howie, was that, you and I engaged in a very collaborative process and you asked questions that I didn't really think about because I, I wasn't trying to teach this to other people. I was just trying to do it. And your questions, you know, made me, you know, I mean, I remember lots of conversations we have when I was like, I, I don't know, that's just what I do. Like, I don't know why I'm doing it or how it works or, and, and you really, I mean, it was a beautiful process. You continued to push my thinking and push the sort of, discipline of articulating what it is that makes these four steps work. Yeah. And it was great for me too, because I've been using your methodology to teach, you know, health coaching. And I used the, the previous iteration of the four steps, which was quick. And 
I never really understood how to teach Q and U, question and understand. And I realized like that was like that was a weakness and my students weren't really getting it. And like once they got to identify options, choose and contract, they OK, we get this. But the first part is like, I don't know, just like float around for a while, see what you're doing. Be as smart as Peter, just, you know. And so the like it was such a pleasure to to translate those into outcome and opportunity the first, you know, to the second and third steps. It's like, oh, now I see how to teach this. Yeah, it was fun for me too. And it's, it's funny because I am now like my, when I use my process, when I'm actually coaching, I'm just doing what I do. But recently I've been explicitly following the process, like saying, okay, I'm going to really go from you know critic to ally to outcome to opportunity to plan and be very very deliberate about what i'm doing at each stage and like i'm happy to say it still works <laughs> it's uh it, it's um it's you know it's sort of like testing it in the field and and uh i'm very appreciative of you and our work together to get it to that place of simplicity yeah well for me it's turned into like that uh, conscious competence thing where all of a sudden okay i've been coaching this way for years and now i don't exactly know what i'm doing anymore so i i actually have like a two-page cheat sheet cheat that sheet. i, just, I, love I it. keep on my i keep it on my desk and i coach based on it and i'm clearly you know, i'm i'm much you know i'm getting better but i'm i'm sort of much more awkward right and like i'm learning a new dance step and i'm staring at my feet a little bit you know, it's something that you and I say in You Can Change Other People, which is don't make it a secret that you're following a process. It doesn't have to be. You know, it's not sort of like a conversation that we'll have with people going, hey, I'm using this four step process that I learned in order to help you make this change that you've been struggling with. Are you cool with that? And I might refer to these pieces of paper. I might refer to this cheat sheet periodically. I might, you know, as I'm as I'm kind of working us both through the process. It doesn't, the process is not a secret. There's nothing manipulative about it. Uh, I, I actually had a, a friend of mine and a client email me this morning and, and say, you know, I'm not gonna order this book because I don't believe that you can change other people. Like, I don't believe in this manipulation of, you know, yes, you change other people. We're living in a divisive enough world. And my email back to him was, how long have you known me? Like, do you think I'm going to write a book about manipulating people into changing the way you want them to change? No, like that's not what this is about. This is about becoming allies and, and working together to make the kinds of changes that make everybody's life better. You know, the person you're trying to change, your own, and actually the world. Yeah, well, I mean, what, one thing you said the other day was like, if we had named the book, you can impact other people. <laughs> Like everyone would be like, oh, yes, that's I want that. That sounds great. <laughs> and yet the, the definition of impact is not to just bounce off them and nothing changes. Exactly. And, and also it's like, you know, I still stand behind the title, which is if you and I are having a conversation and, and what is it, you know, what is changing other people? What is a change? It's a discontinuity from the past. It's, you know, you have done something up until now in a certain way. And after our conversation, you begin to change what you were doing. And had we not had that conversation, you would not have changed what you were doing. That's called changing other people. Now, I'm not doing it against your will. I'm not forcing you to do something. But the conversation I'm having with you in a very particular way instigates you to make changes in your life. That's what it means. And the alternative is... Two things. One is I say the wrong thing to you, which happens 99% of the time when we're trying to change people. And that's why that whole idea of you can't change other people, you can only change yourself comes from. But it's totally not true, right? But because we don't know what to say and how to approach, because generally we approach people as a critic versus an ally. Generally, when I want you to change, I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong, or I'm going to tell you that I'm frustrated, or I'm going to tell you what you should do differently, or I'm going to give you advice. And that's going to create resistance because people don't resist change. They resist being changed, right? And so if I'm in a conversation where I am exerting my, or manipulating or exerting my power over you, you're going to resist my change. And that's why people think that you can't change. And the, and the other way is to say, oh, you can't change other people, so I'm not going to do anything. 
and I'm just going to sit silently and grin and bear it, which, you know, both ways hurt the relationship and don't get to the result. So I sort of felt like, all right, well, let's create a third option that actually gets us a result and develops the relationship at the same time. Yeah, actually, you know, there, there's a fourth option that I just realized that I've been doing for years, <laughs> which that? is, which is, you know, the like, you can't change other people, you can only change yourself. So I turn myself into this disgusting avatar of the change, like, look, like I'll sit and I'll eat like a, you know, a piece of lettuce and go, mm, yeah, right. this is good. <laughs> Right. And, you know, I, I love that. And, and the, I mean, I don't love that. Sorry, but I love that you're bringing that up because we do it all the time. Like we really, really try to model the change. And the truth is like, we don't have to model every change. Like I don't, like if I'm asking my children to do something and they go, well, you don't do it. You know, the answer is, well, I, I get to make that choice. Like, like it's great to be a model, but I get to make the choice. This isn't my issue. I'm not struggling with the same thing you're struggling with. Right but you're struggling with it. So do you want to change that? Or do you want to wait until I change it and you never change it? Like, what do you want for your life? What do you want for your life? I'm not asking you what I want for my life. I'm fine with the way I'm doing, but you're not fine with the way you're doing it. So what do you want to do about it? Do you want my help or not? I don't have to help. You could continue in this direction if you want, you know, totally your call. But if you want my help, I'm really happy to help you. And I've got some technology that can make it work. So before we get into the four steps, let's again, maybe, maybe cast your mind back or maybe just what's present for you now, the theory around change. And the first question I'll ask is like, what's more important, a theory of how to get people to change or a theory of what gets in the way of them changing? Does that question make sense? Um, let me see, let me try to answer it. And then, and then tell me if I'm answering it. Um, uh, the theory of how to help people change is based on the theory of why people don't change, right? Meaning that like how we approach the way people change is based on an understanding of why people change and what are the obstacles that get in their way. So the first thing you need to understand is uh, you have to understand change and you have to understand status quo and why people change and why they don't change. And, and, you know, people change when they've got four things, right? They change when they own the change, when they have ownership, they change when they have independent capability, when they're able to make the change, they change when they have emotional courage, right? That's an incredibly important piece of it. Emotional courage, which is the willingness to feel things. If I, you know, if the way I have to change is I'm a wallflower and I don't have difficult conversations with you. And so now I really own it. Like, it's really important for me to have a difficult conversation with you, Howie. And, and I'm capable of doing it. I've, I know how to have difficult conversations. I've read all of, you know, Peter Bregman's work and I understand you have to start with a punchline, you know, and then you have to like be clear and specific and et cetera. But now I'm about to pick up the phone and call you. And it's terrifying. Because what if you get mad at me? What if you turn it around and challenge me, you know, and then I get defensive? What if you say, yes, thank you so much for the feedback. I really appreciate it. And then you don't talk to me for four weeks, right? Like all of these things might happen. And if I have the emotional courage, the willingness to feel all of those things, then I'll be able to follow through on it and do it. So I need the emotional courage to follow through and act and change is like 2% awareness and 98% follow through, right? It's, it's not, the, the, the hard thing about change isn't knowing what to do. The hard thing about change is following through on doing it. And then finally, um, future-proofing, which is I, the better I get at this, the more challenging situations I'm gonna be in the future. And I better be capable of maintaining my commitment and following through when the going gets tough. So those are the four things you need, ownership, independent capability, emotional courage, and, and future-proofing, you know, resilience. Um, if you don't have those things, you probably won't change in a sustainable way. So that's important to understand. And then, you know, the, one of the obstacles is when I try to help you change, oftentimes 
when people try to help others change, they undercut those four things. They'll do it for them or they'll tell them exactly what to do. If I tell you exactly what to do, you're not developing independent capability. You also don't have ownership. It's not coming from you. I would rather a suboptimum solution that you come up with yourself than an optimal solution that I come up with that you then you know, are going to follow or not. So it's like understanding the dynamics of what enables someone to change, but also understanding the kind of obstacles that not only come up in the context of change, but specifically come up when I try to help you change in the wrong ways. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm violating every rule that our media trainers said, you know, 30 second responses to quick questions. And sorry, you could, you know, corral me in if you need to. <laughs> oh, well, do you need to change? I don't think so. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's, you know, it's really easy to keep to 30 seconds. Just ask a question. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm happy. If, if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. I'm just punting. I'm having fun, like thinking this stuff through. Yeah, no, my defense is just wearing down your offense, you know. <laughs> no, so, so if, you know, if people need those four things in order to change, well, I think one of the things that, that we talked about that gets in the way is we think that the important thing is the change itself. Like that's the end goal of what we're trying to do. Like, okay, so so-and-so is doing X and we want them to do Y. So we focus on like all that matters is then they do Y. And so why, why is that suboptimal? Um, because you're then both not only the bottleneck, but you're in, you know, necessary for every step of the way that the goal is not to get them to make the change. The goal is for the change to be sustainable and that they're independently sustainable in doing it. Like that's the change. We're not forcing people to do things we want them to do we're building up their capability. Think, I mean, this is obvi obviously true for our children, right? That's the most obvious thing. Like, I don't want my kids only eating broccoli when I literally force them to put it in their mouths. I want them eating broccoli because they want to eat broccoli, right? And so I want to eat them to eat broccoli because they recognize that they feel better when they eat broccoli and that's something that they can do. Now, I don't want to infantilize the organizational dynamic but it's absolutely the same for employees and managers, right? Which is ultimately you want to grow and develop employees and, and colleagues and anyone you work with to be able to independently create the kinds of outcomes that they're creating. That, you know, that sometimes we fear that because then maybe are we necessary? Like, am I, am I needed as a manager if they can do it on their own? And the answer is I've seen way more managers stunted because they don't have time to do the work that they need to do. They don't have time to manage. They don't have time to be strategic because they're doing all of their employees work. And the results of the organization is fine because they have very high standards and they're making sure that everybody delivers, but their careers stall out because they don't have time to do the next level work that moves them to the next level. And their employees stall out too because their employees move from one part of the organization to another and then they're suddenly incapable and they're not able to like do the things they were doing previously because they weren't really doing them alone. So our goal in, in helping people change is to help them really become independently capable. Gotcha. All right, so let's let's jump to the four steps. Um, so the the first step, um, and I'm remembering when the book the subtitle was three steps with a two step oh, right. three step and a multi step post step. I, I still remember that. That was the subtitle of the book: a three step process with a two step pre step and a multi step post step. <laughs> I still, think I we still like that title. We should have split test it. <laughs> Um, but the, my kids the, like that title too. The the pre step um, that was the the two step pre step is now step one, right? Which we which at some point we realized like this is kind of core to what we're talking about. You know, we it's, almost call the book "Critic to Ally," right? Because it is such an important step, and it's both a mindset and it's an action, right? Which is. Almost always when we want to change people, it's coming from a place of frustration. And we want to change people from a place of frustration. We're annoyed or we're angry or we're sad or we're scared, right? Because we want the best for them. And we see them doing things that are not helping them. And so it is very easy 
to act out of that frustration. And if you want to be effective, you got to get you you could you could use the frustration as data that something needs to change, but you don't want to speak from that frustration because if you come out as a critic. What that is going to do is to drive the other person to shame, right? Unless they're incredibly skilled at giving feedback. I've been thinking about this a lot in relation to feedback, which is, you know, there's this whole dynamic out in the world of like, let's be totally, you know, truthful with each other and give people the feedback and they can handle it. And they're all adults in the room and, you know, you're not doing me any favors by not telling them the truth and be ruthless about, about telling them the truth. And, and, you know, what I have found is unless you're incredibly skilled, incredibly skilled at offering feedback in a certain kind of way, and you have a process for helping them move from that place, from that place of feedback to a place of different action in the future, then feedback leads like negative critical feedback leads to shame and there's two and shame is the most difficult thing for a human being to experience like shame speaks to people at the core of who they are you know and being embarrassed about something is more like uh there's something i did that i'm embarrassed about being ashamed is there's something wrong with me right there's something essential to who i am that's wrong and we will do anything not to feel it. And the two easiest ways to not feel shame is denial and defensiveness, right? So if you're gonna you know, call me out on something and I feel shame, my very quick, easy response is to have it be a blind spot. Like, I, I don't see it. I know, I know you say I talk too long and too much, but I don't see it. Um, and that protects me, right? So you want to bypass the shame. And also, by the way, like not only is this more effective, it's kinder and more loving. Like I don't want to live in a world where we are shaming each other in order to get us to change. So even if it worked, I'm not down with it. Yeah. Well, too late. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. So I would like to help change that world. I would like to change the world because that's the world that we live in. We live in a world in which... And by the way, that's that's kind of like on the good side, what my client and friend emailed me about saying, I don't want anything to do with the book that says you can change other people, is the, the good part of where he's coming from is he's saying, look, I don't want more shame in our world. I don't want more divisiveness in our world. I don't want more like forcing people. And I agree with him around that, right? That's why we wrote the book. And so, so going into shame and doing the things that create shame uh, is, is not effective. So the first thing you need to do, because we've already established, you're probably feeling that anger or sadness or fear or frustration when you want someone else to change, is to settle yourself, like to recognize that it's data, to breathe, to notice what you're feeling in various parts of your body, to notice what's going on in your head, to notice what's going on in your emotions and your psyche and your intellect. And also notice that the criticism that you feel for this person is coming out of a good intent. Remember, you wouldn't be frustrated by the way someone's acting if you didn't care deeply about them and or the outcome. Right. And so it's coming from a place of good intent. The next thing you do is you begin to do the same thing for them without them, but to imagine for yourself what's their good intent in doing this thing. Like everybody acts in ways that are completely and totally logical in their minds. Like they are doing things for good reason to them. And so it's very helpful to understand that because. This is not a process where you're up against someone. This is a process where you're with them, right? You're not staring each other down, blocking each other's punches. You're both looking together at something in the distance and saying, let's get there together. That's the dynamic. That's the visual I want in your head. And so, you know, so the first steps is you prepare yourself in relation to yourself. You prepare yourself in relation to them. And then you ask them for permission right? You're not changing them against their will. 
You're empathizing with them. This is our three-part formula. You're empathizing with them. You're expressing confidence in their ability and you're asking them permission to think through with them how this might change. If they say no, then the answer is no. It's not up to you. It's up to them. You're their ally. You're their support. You're not their you know, prison guard and you're not their enforcer. Um, if they say no, then you say, okay. And when you say, okay, I'm gonna be okay with your no, you're also voicing to them that you're an ally. And if they ever do get to a yes, they know they can reach out to you. And that has happened to me multiple times, especially by the way, with my children. So two, two thoughts about that. One, one is since starting to write the book, I have changed something that I used to do on social media, which is I no longer like rebroadcast posts and tweets and memes that make me write. <laughs> right? Huh, like I see they say more. Well, I see like all this stuff like like um, you know, that like cartoons about how stupid anti-vaxxers are. <laughs> or or like you know, the last year of the presidency of Trump and the politics and you know, and those people, you know, the deplorables or now like there's all these cartoons about people taking horse medicine and like growing tails and things. And, and like, I could still, you know, like I still have very strong opinions. Right. And um, I still, you know, I still think I'm right. What I, what I realized with those, what, you know, I'm posting those things either to people who are going to agree with me and we're all going to feel good about ourselves because the others are so dumb or someone in my feed is going to see it and be shamed and be angered and is going to respond with anger and we so, could lose the relationship. And like, right. I just like, it had nothing to do with the book. You can change other people, but it was just, Oh, this isn't congruent with the influence I want to have on the world. And I was really like how, how much fun it is to post those things and to laugh at those things and to share those things with other people. It really is a form of like ego addiction and it's been you know, hard to break. I totally get that. And I, I, you know, it's like, it's like humor at the expense of other people. Like, is it worth it? You're going to get the laugh you're going to get, but is it ever worth doing humor at the expense of other people? And, and it, you know, I grew up in a family that was based in humor at the expense of other people, <laughs> you know, like that was like our wit and, and it is hard to break. And I, it's interesting that you say that because this morning, there was a, a Wall Street Journal article that would that actually I, I heard on NPR also that was about investigative reporting about Facebook. And what it was saying about Facebook is that um, they knew that there was they 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 basically went to certain high profile accounts and they took off all the rules of oversight to allow that to both encourage them, but to allow them to, uh, to kind of post what they wanted. And, and, and what, what turned out, and, and the reason they were doing that was because they found that when you post something that is extreme, it creates a lot of, of interaction. It creates a lot of of, you know, it, it basically drives up the interaction, which drives up the ad dollars, which drives up the, the, the revenue. And, and, and I was listening to this and it, what it made me think was, and Facebook said, yes, that's true. And we're going to look into it, <laughs> yeah. um, which I appreciated. Like they didn't deny it. Um, but, but it, it, you know, we, we as, as, as individuals who use social media, in many cases have gotten hooked into this idea that success in equals number of you know, interactions, like that, that our success is Facebook success, that the more people that follow us, the more people that, you know, it, that, that react to what we're saying, that that means that we're successful, that we're more famous or we're more, I don't know what, and more popular, and it really like that's really where in fact this goes to the second 
part of the process, right? Which is outcome, which is asking the question, what is the outcome I want? Like, what is the outcome I want? Is the outcome I want a million followers? Like, is that what I want for the sake of what? Like, what's that going to get me? And for most of us, we're not looking at a million followers, right? Anyway, we're looking at a few more followers, you know, like we're looking at, you know, maybe a hundred more followers. What's that going to get me? It's going to make me feel good because and comfortable because I've got more people watching me. But what is the outcome I want? And if the outcome I want is as many followers as possible, then you have to ask that second question for the sake of what? And if for the sake of what is to have a positive, productive influence in the world, then you got to go back and go, so is the way I'm getting those followers helping me get to the outcome I want? You know, if the outcome I want is a positive influence in the world, then getting followers by creating a negative influence in the world or by creating discord or by creating is not going to get me to the outcome of having a positive influence in the world. Right. So asking this question of like, what is the outcome I want is such a simple question, but it is life changing when it says, OK, well, if I'm going to get, you know, if this is if 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 my the outcome I want is to have a positive, productive influence in the world. Well, then I have to rethink what I'm doing and whether it's getting me there. Mm-hmm. Right. So how does that question play out when we're helping other people? Like why? Why is, you know, they've just said, okay, Peter, I, I'm definitely struggling with this. Help me with this problem. Why, so, don't, why don't we just, why don't we just like be smart and help them with the problem? Okay. So just for the fun of it, I'm going to turn that question back on you since you wrote this book with me. And why <laughs> is that, Howie? I'm going to let you answer a question. <laughs> <laughs> Start the stopwatch. See if I can do it in 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, man, I was so comfortable. your mindset, right? You're just thinking of the questions. You're not thinking of the answers. But I know you know these answers as well as I do. I was having so much fun. Now I got to <laughs> now I got to work. I got to turn on my AC. I'm sweating. Yeah. The, well, when people when people well, well, Peter, I, I know I've never been able to do that in an interview. I love it. <laughs> yeah. But such a great coaching uh, technique. Though. Right. What, what, what do you think? Right. What do you think? <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, when people are focused on their problem, wait, can I just tip- pause? Can I pause for a second? Yeah, I just want to point out something that happened just now that is so uh, endemic to the process, which is, and this happens all the time when I'm coaching. When I'm answering all the questions, then it's easier. I'm not saying your job is easy in terms of asking questions, but it's easier to be able to like listen and be a little distant from the answer. And you could, you know, enjoy it and you can say there's wisdom in it and you can learn from it. But when the question is turned on you and saying, well, you answer this question and, or you role play this, or you try this, or you tell me, suddenly the ownership shifts. The ownership shifts from me to you. The independent capability shifts from me to you. And you start to sweat and it gets a little scary and it gets a little harder and you step into it. And that transition point's hard, but there's no question in my mind that you can answer any of the questions that you're asking me, right? We wrote this book together. So you can answer all these questions, but not to have to answer it takes you off the hot seat. But as soon as you get on the hot seat, your level of ownership and capability immediately grows. It requires some emotional courage to do it. And you become better able to do it in any future scenario, which means that the four elements of change immediately shift to you just from my saying, hey, how are you answer that question instead of me? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. I mean, you know, that sweat actually smells like growth. <laughs> right. And, and we know that I've done it because I've been I've been answering question number two for most of the interviews. Exactly. But it, exactly. But it was just like, all right, I got to crank up the the, the engine. And that's what you want. When you're helping someone change, you want that moment where they crank up the engine, where they're not just saying, hey, Peter, give me advice. What should I do here? But when they suddenly are on the hot seat and they have to figure out what they do, that's when they're beginning to build the muscle to change themselves. Right. Great. So now that we've done this demo, tell me about outcome. No, no, no. That's that's also a technique that clients use all the time. But the answer is, oh, I'm glad that that demo was useful. So now you tell me, Howie. <laughs> all right. So, 
So this comes from my understanding of sort of um, you know neurology and and physiology that when that that our there's part of our brains of our nervous system that is constantly scanning the environment for threat. It's very very useful. It's it happens when we're sleeping, when you hear a noise that would wake you up, and other noises that are familiar don't wake you up. The sis, the circuit the system's always running, and when we are focused on a problem, that's the predominant system that's running in our brain, and it's got a particular physiology. It's got particular brain chemistry and systems to it, and what it does, it's very good of getting us to focus on what we don't want so we can avoid it. And you can, you know, avoid avoiding something means we're focusing on it. And unless it's something we can physically run from or beat up, it's going to follow us because it's not because it's it's part of our lives. It's embedded. So the idea of shifting the question to, well, what do you want instead of that problem? awakens a circuitry in our brain that is for discovery, for finding new opportunities. You can think of it like running away from the bad weather or running away from the predator versus looking for rabbits, looking for berries, looking for mates, looking for a nice spot to camp for the night. So and that, that allows our brain to become much more creative, generative, positive, and it's a way if, if there has been, res, you know, residual shame around the problem, it kind you know, when we when the problem falls away from our consciousness a little bit, so does the shame, we become happier. It's like, oh, now I get to go for something. It's great. And, and it's totally right. And and um, it, it's not just a change in dynamic. It's actually a change and, and not just a change in focus to go from frustrated or smaller to expansive and excited. It does that. And it also often changes what you're gonna do. Like if, if my, you know, if my, if my, this is an example that we use in the book. If my problem is I have someone who I think is disruptive in the team, uh, uh, then, you know, my immediate, if I wanna just solve that problem, I can take them off the team. But, when I sort of say, okay, that's the problem, like the person on the team is a problem. So what's the outcome I want? The outcome I want isn't a team without disruption. That's too low a bar. So, you know, if someone says I want a team without disruption and I'm, and I'm helping them, I'm coaching them or I'm helping them with this process, I'm going to say that's too low a bar. That's all you want. You want like a team without disruption. What do you hope for the sake of what? What do you hope that will get you? Right? And, and, you know, what the answer eventually is, I want a high performing team. Like I want a team that, that works, that's not, not only is it not disrupted, but that it performs incredibly well. Well, it turns out to have a high performing team, you need team members who are willing to engage in conflict. Like you need that. So this person who's a problem might just be an opportunity to help you get to the outcome that you're going for. So it's like, you know, as you're, as you're identifying an outcome that's different, the solutions to achieving that outcome become, uh, become very different. Right. Yeah. And we saw that the other day when we were being interviewed by, I think it was Chris, and, and you were talking about, you know, choosing the outcome instead of eating less sugar, I want to be healthy and vibrant. And as soon as you said that, he said, oh, I just figured out how, how I can deal with the problem of I have this home gym that I'm not using. Okay. Like just asking the question very often, you know, what's the outcome you want instead of, oh, how do I just use this gym? Like for the sake of, oh, health. Oh, right. It just, it right. just opens up new opportunities because, because anyone who's been trying to solve a problem who come, you know, comes to you for help or is struggling so much that you notice and offer help, they've been trying to figure it out with their great big brain for a long time. Right. And it's not that they need another answer or to be smarter. 100%. Share the research about the newspaper ads. I love that research. Uh, yeah, this was um, a researcher named Richard Wiseman, who was curious about luck and wanted to find out, like, what's, what, what's the dynamics of some people who are lucky and others who aren't? So his, his, um, his experiment was to 
bring a bunch of people in the room, have them basically answer the question, am I a lucky person or not? And then divide them into two groups. And each group got the same deal. They got a, a, a newspaper with a bunch of photographs in it. And they were asked to count the photographs in the newspaper for money, like, you know, do the task and get paid like a lot of psychology experiments. And in, on the second page, I think in like two inch high font, there was a box and it said, there are 43 photos in this newspaper. And the people who called themselves lucky saw it much more frequently than the people who didn't consider themselves lucky. And they just handed it in and they got paid. Then later on in the same newspaper was another thing saying, if you see this, put down the paper, show this to the, um, to the experimenter and you can win $100. <laughs> And only the lucky people did that. So it turns out that his hypothesis, which he demonstrated in the study- only, not, not only the lucky people, only the people who consider, who had a self-concept of being lucky, who, right. who, who thought of themselves as lucky. Right, so it turns out that, that reg if, if, regardless if there's some actual magical thing called luck that sort of tilts the, the, the game board of life in our direction, that most of what we, uh, understand, you know, think of as lucky is a function of focus, is a function of am, what am I looking for? Am I looking for opportunities in my environment? And if I'm looking for them and I've trained myself to, uh, to look positively for the good things that I don't yet have, then I get them. And if I'm focused solely on the bad things that I have, I keep them. Right, right. It's, uh, it's, you know, our friends, uh, Chester, a uh, Chester uh, Elton and Adrian Gostick, who write about gratitude, uh, think about this a lot, like what you're, you know, like if you're, uh, you know, what you focus on is the life you end up living. Yeah, and that's why gratitude is such a great hack for, for a better life. And I think we, one, one of the things we realized when we were talking to Chester and Adrian and trying to, you know, figure out how to combine our, our worldviews is that every one of these four steps in some way is supportive of gratitude, right? It's, yeah. it's all about it's, negative to positive. Exactly. It's, it's, it's about moving something from a negative to, to a positive. And, and that's, you know, people want to change in that environment. They want to change when they're looking at the positive as opposed to the negative. Right. Cause it does, you know, in fact, change, I think some of the reason we're getting some pushback on that word is that maybe embedded in change as a kind of uh, negative, whereas like growth is kind of the same word, like, oh, I'll, you know, I want you to grow, but I want you to stay the same. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Right, right. It was a Broadway play like that. I love you yeah. now. I love oh, you. I love you. You're perfect. You're perfect. Now change. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's true. All right. So tell us about the the last step, planning. Oh, well, yeah. Have we done opportunity? Oh, uh, maybe not. I thought I was talking about opportunity when I was talking about. Well, let's let's uh, be. Yeah, let's be a little team. bit. We explicit. be more explicit about it. Okay, so tell us about opportunity, Howie. Oh, me? <laughs> I'm not okay. Now. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, once once we we now have two things. We have the outcome, the energizing outcome as we call it. And we still have the problem, right? We still have the, the, the thing that triggered the conversation, whichever person initiated it. Right. So the yeah. outcome is I want a high performing team. And the problem is I've got this disruptive member on the team. Right. So if, if we're just saying, I, you know, if, if we're just trying to solve the problem, the answer is fire them, right? right? Move them off the team, sideline them, give them busy work, make them take minutes, so they're too busy you know, writing things down to be able to talk. And as we saw, when once we have an outcome that that, you know, the, the question then is, does getting rid of the problem give you the outcome you want? And the answer is almost always no. So in that case, we don't just say, well, what else? We do say like, what, what else do you need in order to have this outcome? But then we turn back to the problem and say, is there a way that this problem can actually help us get to the outcome. In other words, is the problem actually a hidden opportunity? Right. So if I'm, let's say, you know, in my life, I've, um, you know, got a bunch of kettlebells that are lying around the house and they're always in the way and I'm not strong enough to lift them. And that's a real problem. <laughs> right. I got to carry them one at a time. I can't pick them up two at a time and be efficient with it. 
well, duh, <laughs> like those kettlebells are the weights that I'm going to use to get strong enough to move the kettlebells, right. right? And so this disruptive person on the team is actually an opportunity to teach everyone else how to be a little bit disruptive, but to have everybody else teach this person how to be a little more respectful and caring. How can, can we have both? Can we have a team in which people are challenging each other and maintaining and growing relationship? And, and I'll add one more piece to it, which is just by having the conversation about how we're operating as a team and what is disruption and what is productive conflict, we're creating a high performing team. So the problem itself is being solved by saying, you know, there is an opportunity to talk about what's happening and, and that's going to be a little bit of productive conflict in and of itself. And to learn how to do that in a way that allows everybody to up their game so that we can have a really high functioning team where we don't brush things over the, and under the rug and we don't just cut out the people who don't fit you know, our mold, but that we're able to have the conversations that allow us to bring in diverse perspectives in order to still get to an outcome. Yeah. So these, these three steps are all sort of beautiful and that we, you know, we can sort of like people who love to think and talk and solve problems. Um, we're great to have these conversations, but we needed a fourth step, right? Because we can't just end with a beautiful insight, right? So talk, talk about plan. I like how you jump into the question very quickly before I could spin it back on you. Okay, I'm going to talk about plan. So, so um, plan is the part that often happens in coaching, uh, but too soon, right? So we're like, okay, you have a problem, great. So you're gonna fire her, by when? When are you gonna do it? What are you gonna say to her? How are you gonna... Um, so, so oftentimes it's brought in too soon before you're actually really solving the right thing and finding the right opportunity to ach achieve the you know, right outcome. So once you've done that work, you still need plan. The most important thing is not to have a perfect solution. The most important thing is to follow through on something as an experiment that might get us closer to the outcome. That's what's important. That's what change is about. It's what life is about. I mean, when we started this conversation talking about my career and my career has been like deeply unstrategic because I just keep like doing experiments to say, is this closer to that intersection between my joy and the world's needs? And, you know, maybe for a while it is, and then it's not, and then I have to keep changing. And I, and so, so that's the game of the plan stage, which is to say, what, what are we going to try? What can you try? What can you try? May or may not work, but that would reflect moving forward on you know, achieving the outcome, finding an opportunity that will also resolve the problem that you're facing, that will put you, you know, more higher, a higher bar than just solving the problem. What can you try? What can you do? And let's talk about a bunch of things that you can do. And we talk about a level 10 plan. And a level 10 plan is after you've designed the plan, here's what I'm going to do this week or tomorrow or whenever it is. Um, the question is, how confident are you that you will follow through? Right? We're not asking the question, how confident are you that this will work? That doesn't matter, actually. What matters is how confident are you that you will follow through? That's what matters. People will change when they take ongoing actions and they follow through on their own commitments to take those actions, right? So, you know, as, as my daughter Sophia said to me when I ate a little sugar yesterday um, after she and I had decided we weren't going to eat sugar, she said, Dad, I don't know how you're successful at anything in your life if you can't maintain this commitment. <laughs> and I was like, it was just sugar. And she's like, no, it's not just sugar. You said you weren't going to eat it and you ate it. That's what it is. And I'm like, oh my God, go easy on me, babe. Yeah. Uh, but she's hundred percent right. You know, like, it's like the goal is follow through. And by the way, if eating if not eating sugar, if I fail at that every single time, then maybe I need to change the goal so I can succeed at something to build my muscles so that I can get to the point where I don't eat sugar. Um, but this was Sophia, my 16 year old, and she's <laughs> totally right. Um, and so, so the goal is how confident are you? And if you're a 10 in confident, great. A lot of times people will say 11. I will definitely, this conversation has been great. I will definitely follow through on it. Sometimes I'll say six. 
And then the question is, well, what's the gap? Like what would, what's missing that would make you attempt? Because we want to solve for follow through. We want to solve for, I will take this action that will move me in some direction closer to the outcome that I want to achieve. Gotcha. So first of all, the correct answer to Sophia is you obviously haven't read my book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? All so I thought was shame. Shame her right back. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, I mean, what, what I'm what I'm hearing is both in your, you know, yes, your career has been deeply unstrategic, but it's also been deeply strategic. And, and like the role model that we're going for here is evolution, or right. almost artificial selection, like we have a, an outcome in mind, and we're going to try things, and we're going to try a bunch of things, and we expect that some of them will be dead ends, and some of them will be suboptimal, and some of them will work for a while and then not. But the bringing this attitude, again, of positivity and gratitude to the plan means that like when I'm coaching someone and before I understood this, we'd come up with a great plan and oh, I'm, I'm a genius and I help them. And they, of course, you know, have ownership over it. And we're both really excited and it fails. And my, man, they're deflated now. Right. Right. Because right. they, you know, and so I started telling people like on our first coaching session that this is going to be like learning how to play the piano. Like, do you, can you imagine anyone trying to play the piano and never hitting a wrong note? <laughs> like, you're going to hit wrong notes. You're going to quit? Or are the wrong notes actually your teachers? Yeah, and when we remove the shame at the beginning, like when we're really their ally, right? We remove the shame at the beginning. Then we also remove the weight of success. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to work. Why don't we try and see? Like, let's be scientists here. Everything we do is an experiment. So let's think like a scientist. The, uh, uh, an experiment that achieves the objective is, gives us data. Uh, an experiment that does not achieve the objective, what some people would say fails, like a successful experiment gives us data. A failed experiment gives us data. Like they both move us closer to where we're going. We're getting information. You know, sometimes I'll try something and it really doesn't work at all. And like, I'll laugh to myself, like it really doesn't bother me. I'll laugh to myself and I'll think, oh, well that went pretty well. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's like, I just don't take it too seriously because like, that's how we learn. Like, otherwise we're never gonna wanna do anything that's outside of our comfort zone. And then we won't build our emotional courage. And if we don't build our emotional courage then we'll really never be able to change effectively. Yeah, I saw a great example of this, um, a trailer for Aaron Sorkin's masterclass on screenwriting. Uh -huh. He's got a bunch of people in the room and he's got, okay, we've got a 90 minute script to fill here. We need ideas. We need ideas. And people are like frozen and terrified. And he says, but what we're going to do, let's come up with terrible ideas. And all of a sudden they come spurt and he goes, that's a terrible idea. And he smiles and he writes it on the board and like, oh yeah, that's an awful idea too. And then a third one, that's a terrible idea. Actually, that one's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's great it's great it's great we put so much i mean i'm just listening to us talk and i'm and i'm listening to this point and i realize like we put so much pressure on ourselves we put so much pressure on ourselves to perform to succeed to get it right and you know if if this process could just break that like could just reduce the pressure we put on ourselves to be perfect then we will have done, I think, the world an immense uh, a gift. We would have given the world an immense gift because I think we have to become more playful. I think we have to take ourselves and everything else a little less seriously. And I think that we'll be able to move forward more effectively when, when we're able to come to it from that mindset. Mm. Do you think it's too late to change the title to The Gift of Imperfection? Um, I do. I, I don't know. Why don't you ask our publisher? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask our publisher. And, and one of us can change our name to Brene Brown and then it's yeah, a seller. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm a little worried that people aren't going to want to buy the book now. <laughs> like um, we've, we've given know, them everything. Uh, yeah. We? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I really love about the way we wrote this book, to be honest. Not that the rest of this isn't honest. I hate that phrase, to be honest. To be honest, everything else I've said is a lie. Um, 
but it's, we really wrote it to be a guidebook, to be very practical. We have tons of dialogue in it. We have tons of it. Like, it's not, it's not just examples, it's examples, but it's, here's what you say. Here's what you shouldn't say. Like, don't say this because that's going to get you in trouble. Here's why. Do say that because that's going to help you. And here's why. And so it's like, you know, the, the process is meant to be used. This is not a conceptual book. Like what we've shared are the concepts. This is not a conceptual book. This is a very practical how-to guide and manual to helping you help other people make changes in their lives. Uh, so I do encourage that you buy it. If you buy it, I'm gonna go out on a limb now and, and I'm gonna pause. Claire, you can cut this out if this doesn't work, but we have a pre-order uh, offer that we're going out and the book uh, lands on the 22nd, September 22nd. This, uh, this podcast is going live on September 20th. The podcast goes live on September 20th. So you've got three days and, and if possible, I'll, uh, I don't know when you're listening to this, but if you happen to be listening to this later in the week, I'm going to see if we can make this pre-order offer available to the end of the week. I don't know for sure that that's going to be a possibility or not. I have to actually ask um, Claire, who's mastermind, who's our producer of the show and who's masterminded this. But, but if it is possible, the pre-order offer is Howie and I, each of us have coached two people each. So Howie's coached two people, I've coached two people uh, using this process. And the audio of that coaching is available uh, if you, if you pre-order it. Um, so if you're listening to this before the 22nd, if you want to make sure you get the offer, uh, do it, uh, you know, uh, pre-order the book before the 22nd. If, if you're listening to it after, um, you could try and it may work to the end of the week. I don't know. Uh, um, and, and if you pre-order it, you'll just go to our website and you see, you, you send your receipt or a, you know, copy of your receipt or a picture of your receipt uh, to pre-order at bregmanpartners.com pre-order at bregmanpartners.com listen to you rocking the marketing i'll tell you what i'm trying it's not my forte <laughs> yeah so so i'll say that no matter when you get the book there are a bunch of bonuses in in the book that we that you can get that aren't in the book right that um, there's a page in the book that will take you to the bonuses, which includes like nine additional dialogues, full dialogues that are all annotated. So every single step of the way, here's how we do this, here's what worked here, um, as well as other audios. And we're gonna continue adding to that library because I, you know, we, we see this book as the, the spearhead of something, whether it's a community or a training organization, um, you know, we're gonna keep uh, sharing material. So it's much more than just words on the page. Also, you got to read the audio book. So that one, that's available. Oh, right. too. I got to read the audio book. That was really, really fun. And I have to say, and this is sort of, you know, self-congratulatory for us, but it was really fun and really easy to read the audio book. Meaning we, we successfully wrote the book in a way that reads easily for me. That hasn't been true with every book that I've read. But but it it felt like we got the, you know, we got the uh, the speaking voice. You know, we modeled this book after a coach training uh, that that I ran for many years, and we modeled it after that, and we wanted it to feel like a training. And it it was it was fun and exciting to read the book. So and uh, people can get the book on Amazon, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble. I would love to encourage people if there is an independent bookseller. <laughs> Um, bookstore, bookstore.org, an independent bookseller in your community to support them. Um, you can just, you know, take a picture of the receipt with your phone and send it to pre-order at bregmanpartners.com. And this book is, um, it's a business book. It's a personal book, um, right? I, I, like one of the things that I liked about it is you, you have come at it largely from an organizational career perspective. And I came at it largely at that point from a sort of individual health family perspective. And we could see the same techniques work in both places because we're dealing with humans. Precisely, precisely. And it, it was actually interesting because when we surveyed uh, people, a lot of whom were executives, leaders in their companies, 
one of the questions we asked is who will this be most useful for you for? And a large percentage of them said a family member. Um, so like, you know, it's like, just think of the people in your life who you wish you could help. Like, just think of one person in your life who you wish you could help. And that's, you know, we wrote the book for you to help you do that. Awesome. So do you, do you want to take this out as the podcast? Sure. Host? Yeah. Howie, uh, it's been tremendously fun to have you on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fun. to We didn't know how this would go, but it's been really, really fun. You know, we've done a lot of uh, podcasts together talking about the book and, and this one, you know, had a, a, a bit of a different tone to it. And it was fun to interview each other a little bit. And uh, thank you for doing this on, on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. And thank you for having me on the Plant Yourself Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. It's I think I think we got a wrap. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you.